so you can open up to Revelation chapter 12. We're in Revelation chapter 12, and we're going to cover verses 7 through 12. I intend this to be a shorter sermon. As I said, I was going to break up Revelation 12 into three sermons. Last week, we dealt with verses 1 through 6, and we're answering the question, who is the woman? And we saw that the woman is the uh, representative of the community of true believers, uh, both from Old and New Testament, of course, the church now in the New Testament, that's who the woman is representative of. And um, we saw that she went out into the wilderness, and we saw the historicalness for this based on what took place in 67 AD when all the Christians left Jerusalem because of the impending destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman Empire. Today we're going to continue on with verses... 7 through 12. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word? It says, And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, the serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. May God bless the reading of his word. Uh, The title of my sermon is War in Heaven. Let's pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you for this time we have in your word this morning as we go through the book of Revelation. ask and pray that you use what's preached here for good, that it causes each one to desire to dig into your word deeper, to actually be students of your word, Study these things out, see whether they be so or not, what's being asserted from this pulpit. Lord, I ask and pray that you would glorify yourself through the preaching of the word here this day. May we understand just how great your kingdom is, that it's a conquering kingdom, not a kingdom holed up in a safe room somewhere waiting for the rapture to come, but no, it's a conquering kingdom, one that goes out, takes the task, the forces of evil, declares your law, your great salvation, your word to the nations and conquers. And God, we just ask and pray that we would understand this and that we would live our lives in accordance with this. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. Now, as we've been seeing, as we've been going through the book of Revelation here, we've been seeing that this book of Revelation is not about an end. It's not about the end of all time, as many have asserted for the last 150 years in American Christianity with their eschatological schemes, which I've spent no small time rebuffing. Rather, we see that what's talked about here in the book of Revelation is the beginning. It's about the commencement of Christ's kingdom in the earth, the inaugural of his kingdom in the earth, a kingdom that is meant to expand in the earth, to conquer. The gates of hell can't even stand against it. They're flattened as his kingdom expands throughout the earth. Now, Here in verse 7, we see that war has broken out. We do know that this war took place in heaven somewhere between the incarnation of Christ and the Great Tribulation in 67 A.D., which, of course, culminated with the destruction of the temple in 70 A.D. We do know this war took place somewhere between the incarnation of Christ and the Great Tribulation in 67 A.D., Because as we saw last week, verses 1 through 6 covered this time frame. Covered from the incarnation of Christ to the Christians fleeing Jerusalem in 67 AD. Which is an historical fact. They went to Pella, a city far north of Jerusalem, to find refuge there during the Great Tribulation. We also know that verses 13 through 17, after we get through verses 7 through 12, describing the war in heaven. Verses 13 through 17 go on to continue to talk about this time frame. 
the time frame of the incarnation of Christ to the Christians fleeing Jerusalem in 67 A.D. So we know this war took place somewhere in that time frame, from the incarnation of Christ to the Christians fleeing in 67 A.D. We can also see from the context that Christ's finished work at Calvary was the deciding factor in this war, because verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren accused them before our God day and night has been cast down, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. So we see here that from the context that Christ's finished work at Calvary was the deciding factor in this war. It is what caused the saints to be able to triumph over the devil was the blood of the Lamb. Whether this war broke out after Christ's ascension, as we have described in verse 5, is his ascension, or when the woman, the community of true believers, the church, fled into the wilderness in 67 A.D., which is shown in verse 6 here in Revelation 12, is neither here nor there. The point is a war broke out, and it broke out because of Christ and his work on earth. And I'm going to show you further how this is clearly so as we continue in this sermon. All are agreed, regardless of who they believe the woman is, that verses 7 through 12 explain why the dragon turned on the woman and caused her to flee into the wilderness. Michael and his angels fight against the devil and his angels. Some scholars believe that Michael is a type of Christ and is really Christ himself. This, too, is neither here nor there, as the point of the passage is that a battle is taking place and the devil loses. That's the important part of the passage, not whether Michael is a type of Christ or whatever. The point is, there's a war in heaven and the devil loses. As it says in verse 7, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon, his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, cast down to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The important point of the passage is a war broke out in heaven and the devil is lost. He's been cast down to the earth. Verse 9 is emphatic about the devil being thrown out of heaven. Verse 9 is emphatic about the devil being thrown out of heaven. The fact that he has lost, he has been crushed in battle. Look in verse 9. Three times it talks about him being cast out or cast down. Three times in one verse. So the great dragon was cast out. There's one. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast down to the earth. There it is twice. And his angels were cast out with him. There's the third time. Verse 9 is emphatic that the devil has lost. And what has brought about his defeat in this war? Verses 10 through 12, particularly verses 10 and 11, make it clear that what brought about his defeat is the work of Christ in the earth. His incarnation, his ministry, His death on the cross, His resurrection, His ascension. This is what has brought about His defeat. What He did at Calvary, when He died in our stead, has brought about a crushing defeat to the devil. Verses 10 and 11. Verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven. This was a hymn that they were singing in heaven. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren accused them before our God day and night has been cast out. Notice in verse 10, we see again it being talked about that the devil has been cast out. He's suffered a crushing defeat. And it has to do with the work of Christ. His kingdom has come. Salvation has come. As it says here, he has power now or authority. 
the Scripture says here. I want to really key in on that in a moment, but before I do, let me point out the fact that here the Scripture also points out at the end of verse 10 that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. This has always been his role to accuse those who follow after God. You may recall with Job, Job chapter 1, verses 6 through 11, you can mark that down in your notes. He came and accused Job before God. And we see it again in the book of Zechariah with Joshua the high priest. Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 and 2 for your notes. Zechariah 3, verses 1 and 2 for your notes, where Joshua the high priest is accused by the devil. So this has always been his role, is to be an accuser of the brother. But now he's been cast out of heaven. And why has he suffered this crushing defeat? Because now salvation has come. Now the kingdom of the Christ has come. Now he has the power, as it says here in verse 10. He has the authority, as it says here in verse 10. This is not some futuristic event. I've been showing you this as we've continued through the book of Revelation. This is not some futuristic event. It was futuristic to John, because he wrote about it before it took place. It was futuristic to his hearers. Hadn't taken place yet for them. But it's not futuristic to us because it has since taken place. It took place from 67 to 70 A.D. So this is not some futuristic event that we're all sitting around here waiting to happen. He didn't say all those things to the seven churches and then, for what reason? Because we're all still waiting for it to happen 2,000 years later. No, he told it was going to affect them back then. This is not some futuristic event. This took place, what's talked about here in verse 10, this took place through Christ's finished work at Calvary, as the overall context clearly shows. Again, talking about His blood. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. Talking about salvation has come. His kingdom has come. He has power now. Authority now. And we know this to be true from Scripture elsewhere. When did salvation come? When did His kingdom come? When was all power or authority given to Christ? And when was Satan cast down? As it says at the end of verse 10. When did all these things take place? Well, look at Scripture itself and it will make it clear to you. Let's deal with the end thing first. The casting down or Satan being cast out. Turn with me to Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Look at what Jesus said here. Remember, he sent out the 70 to do missionary work. And it says in verse 17, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He has power now. He has authority now. And look what it goes on and says, And Jesus said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. When was he cast out? He was cast out of heaven while Christ was on earth doing his earthly ministry. This is when the war took place and the devil lost, suffering a crushing defeat by Christ's work at Calvary. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give you the authority as his people. We have his authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Amen. This is when the devil was cast out of heaven. This is when he was cast down to the earth. There was a battle that took place in heaven while Christ was doing his earthly ministry and the crushing defeat of Satan took place when Christ died on the cross. Utterly crushed the devil at that point. Look at John chapter 12 as I continue on with this point. John chapter 12, verse 31. John chapter 12, verse 31. 
Verse 30 says, Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Look what he says in verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, which is who? The devil, who deceives the whole world. It says back in our passage there in Revelation 12.10. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And he was. He suffered an utter defeat when Jesus died at Calvary. What does the very next verse say? Verse 32. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. What was he talking about? His death at Calvary. As verse 33 says, this he said signifying by what death he would die. This is when the devil was cast out of heaven. This is when he was cast down to earth. There was a war that took place in heaven and he suffered a crushing defeat by the finished work of Christ at Calvary, which is what Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 is talking about. Praise his holy name. Now, let's deal with the aspects of verse 10 in Revelation 12 where it says, Now salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ have come. Let's deal with the aspects of His salvation and His kingdom having come. His kingdom and salvation having come. Remember we talked in the past showing that Christ repeatedly made clear to His disciples that His kingdom is here now? Even though he openly, those he openly preached to, he made clear that his kingdom has come now. Yes, there is still a future aspect to his kingdom, but his kingdom has been here since he began his earthly ministry. The scriptures are repeatedly clear on that. Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. Matthew chapter 12, verse 28. We'll just... Not belabor the point, because I've shown this over and over again in the past, all the many passages where Christ makes clear His kingdom's here now, that it's meant to expand in the earth, that it's meant to conquer in the earth. Here, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 28, Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. The kingdom of God came with Christ. With his appearance on earth came the kingdom of Christ, came the kingdom of God, came the kingdom of heaven on earth with his incarnation, with his earthly ministry, with the work that he did at Calvary. His kingdom came then and has been in the earth since then. A lot of Christians want to relegate God's kingdom just to be off in the future somehow. And yes, there is a future aspect, but that's not all there is. His kingdom's here now, has been for 2,000 years has been expanding in the earth for 2,000 years. Praise His holy name. Some people want to say, oh, well, look how bad things are here in America. It means Jesus has to return. Really? Just read the statistics on Christianity in Africa. People in Africa have become, over the last 100 years, overabundantly Christianized by the millions I think a hundred years ago, about 14% of Africa was Christian. Now over 50% of Africans are Christian. Showing the power and expansion of God's kingdom in the earth. It's meant to expand. The reason things are going down in America is because the church in America is a whore. We live like whores. We behave like whores. We're more interested in being the sugar of the earth than the salt of the earth. And Jesus said, if you won't be the salt of the earth, the only thing you're good for is to be thrown on the ground, trampled on the foot of men. And that's the judgment the American church is suffering right now. That's why our culture is a mess, because the church isn't being the church. The church is more interested in accommodating itself to the world, getting along with the world, being relevant to the world, and in the process making itself irrelevant to the kingdom of God. It's a joke. This is when the kingdom came with Christ and His incarnation, His work on earth. His earthly ministry culminating, of course, with His death on the cross. This is why verse 11 goes on to say, and they overcame Him, the devil, verse 11 of Revelation 12, by the blood of the Lamb, which, of course, He shed at Calvary. This is when salvation came. Amen? When Christ came. We have his kingdom, we have salvation, we have the devil being cast out 
all being seen clearly in the Gospels. This is what Revelation chapter 12, verse 10 is referring to. What about the fact of power or authority? Verse 10. And the power of His Christ have come. The power or authority of Christ have come. This isn't some futuristic event. This too also already took place and Christ affirmed that it had already taken place. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Just uh, several chapters up from where we were there in Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 28. Look what Christ says here. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, this is after He rose from the dead, He died on the cross, rose from the dead. Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to Me in heaven and on earth. This isn't some futuristic thing. It's already taken place. The battle was won. The decisive defeat of Satan took place at Calvary. He died at Calvary. He rose from the dead. The devil is defeated. We have a conquering king with a conquering kingdom who we're supposed to serve. I'm going to be asking Ernie to do a sermon to just show how hymns have changed. Follow the hymns of the early church through the ages, and notice how they talked about this repeatedly, about how nations should be subdued under Christ. How His kingdom marches forward in the earth. How Christianity isn't just have to do with our personal selves, which it does, of course, but it has to do with changing cultures, changing nations, seeing our King's law expanded and held up in the earth. And then watch how it changes over the last 200 years in the hymns we sing. Watch how it changes and watch the difference of 1,800 years of hymns versus the last 150 years of hymns. Look at the difference. You can look at it right in our own hymnal. The difference in the thinking. Because American Christianity, the Christianity that's become popular with its bogus eschatological schemes, has made Christianity, this little subculture, just supposed to sit off in the corner somewhere, waiting for Jesus to return, making sure they keep buying their prophecy books to make some guy rich. Waiting for Jesus to return. No, not at all. Our lives are to count in the earth. We're to serve Christ, our King, in the earth. And to make His law, His word, His great salvation known to others. We are to sacrifice, lay down our lives to bring glory to Him. Amen? That's what we're supposed to be doing. There's tons of people on this planet who've never even heard the name of Jesus yet. People. We have a duty to take His name, His kingdom, His great salvation to them. And to declare Him to the nations. There's tons of other people who just have a bogus idea of who Jesus is. They're all messed up in the head. We have to bring the truth of Him to them too. Praise His holy name. The message of Revelation is consistent with the New Testament as a whole. Christ has arrived. He was incarnated. Christ died and rose. Satan has been thrown down. Salvation has come. The kingdom has come. Colossians 2.15 says that by His death, Christ disarmed the demons triumphing over them. Disarmed the principalities and powers triumphing over them. Through what? His death. This was the decisive battle. It's what Christ did at Calvary. There was war in heaven. The devil has been cast down. All authority has been given to Christ. We as His servants are to go declare His kingdom in the earth. He expands it. Not through the use of the sword or some political machinery. Through the preaching of His Word. We declare the truth of His Word in all aspects of life. Amen? Because His Word speaks to all aspects of life. His Word just doesn't tell people how to get saved and then figure out how you should live from there. No, it shows us how we should live. Amen? It shows how governments should be governed. It shows what's important to God and what's dear to His heart. 
the redeeming work of Christ here in Revelation 12:10 verses 7 through 12 the redeeming work of Christ is here depicted by the cosmic battle of Michael and the dragon the time of the dragon's defeat and ejection from heaven is clearly connected with the incarnation ministry death and resurrection of Jesus. We're not waiting around for this all to happen. It already took place. Somebody said to me, well, if this has already took place, then what good is the book of Revelation? Well, what good is the book of Acts? That already took place. Give me a break. Have you held on to something so long that you can't think outside the box? Have you been taught a lie so long that you can't look at something Differently, properly, something that actually makes sense where you don't have to put your brain on the shelf walking around telling people things that aren't true. Their eschatological schemes have been proven false over and over and over again. How long are you going to be a dummy and keep believing them? Do you say, you know what, I'm not going to get hoodwinked anymore. You know what, I'm not going to be like the dog who the owner acts like he's going to throw the ball, but he really holds on to it and puts it behind his back, and I go off in the field running around trying to find the ball. How often are you going to allow that to continue to take place? You need to study these things out, search these things out, open the Word of God yourself, and study these matters. Because there's a whole generation of American Christians who've been lied to, and have you seen the fruit of it? Look at American Christianity. It's a disaster. A complete and utter disaster. And I contend that it's directly related to the fruit of this bogus eschatology that has been pushed in America for 150 years. Oh, why are you so strong about this, Pastor Matt? I just told you why. I just told you why. Look at the fruit. Look what it's done. Look how it's hampered the work of God in the earth and His kingdom in our nation. Got a bunch of people sitting around, twiddling their thumbs, going to prophecy conferences, thinking, nothing really matters what I do anyways, because <laughs> Jesus is coming back any day. I read the last chapter. We win. Is that it? That's all you got? You stink. If I hear another person say that, I'm going to... Barf. I listen to cross talk, talking about the problems in the earth. Every time people call in, well, at least we know in the end we win. We've read the last chapter. And then somebody always calls in and says, well, why do we care about any of this? It's all supposed to take place. It's prophesied to happen. Just sit back and enjoy. What's important is that we don't have fear while it's going on. Again, the whole pietistic thing. Is this messed up? Am I going to keep pounding at it? You better believe I am. I'm at war with this evil eschatology. I've taken time to study and read through these things and look at them and see that what they teach isn't just some little thing. It's a problem. And it's destroyed the American church. And it needs to be taken to task, and it can be taken to task. And hopefully you can see what I'm saying as we go through these passages. Verses 9 and 10 make clear that the devil has been cast out or cast down because of Christ. And verse 11 makes clear how we are able to overcome him through Christ. Verse 10 makes it clear that the devil has been cast out because of Christ. Verse 11 makes it clear that we can triumph over the devil through Christ. It says that they, talking about who? The saints, the community of true believers, those who know the Lord. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. Amen? By the blood of the Lamb. The salvation which is given to us through Christ. That's what gives us the ability to overcome the devil. When we believe in Jesus, he radically transforms our lives, does he not? We actually want to read the Bible. We actually want to spend time in prayer. We actually want to tell people about Jesus. Praise His holy name. All because of the redemptive work through His blood applied to our lives through faith. 
and by the word of their testimony, by the word of our testimony, we overcome. That our faith is in Christ. That we live true to His word. And they did not love their lives to the death. Christ said, if anyone will follow Me, he has to lay down his life, take up his cross, and follow Me. Isn't that what He said? That's what we should have in our hearts. That's what we're supposed to be as Christians. This is the most important thing in our lives. His glory. Bringing glory to Him. Serving Him in His kingdom to see it expanded in the earth. Unfortunately, most of American Christians hold that as less than paramount and of utter most importance in their lives. How do we know? Just look at the state of American Christianity. You couldn't get people to go out and get a traffic ticket to rescue a preborn baby from being killed 15 years ago, let alone if they would have been executed for intervening on behalf of a little preborn baby's life. When I was young, I used to hear people talk about, I'll be faithful to death. They want me to deny Jesus. I'll be faithful to death. Are you kidding me? You know how many Christian teachers there are in public schools who won't talk about Jesus because they were told they couldn't talk about Jesus? They won't even jeopardize their stinking job, let alone their life. I don't believe any of it for a minute. I've seen the state of American Christianity. It's so accommodated and like the world. They wouldn't know the difference between His kingdom and the kingdom of this world anyway. To know where to take a stand to put their life on the line. It's a sad state of affairs. And I'm talking to myself too. Sad state of affairs. Verse 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Why? Because the devil's gone. <laughs> He's been cast out. Amen? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. Why? Because he's been cast there. <laughs> He's been cast out to the earth. He said he's falling like lightning to the earth. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. Like a cornered rat... The devil becomes more ferocious than ever. Great wrath, it says here in verse 12. Having been defeated at Calvary, he now wants to attack the woman, who of course represents the church or the community of true believers. He wants to attack the woman. We see that in verse 13, don't we? Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman. But verse 12 says, he will only be able to do so for, quote-unquote, a short time. A short time. How much time is short? We know exactly how much time he has from the context here, do we not? Verse 6 makes it clear. He's got 1,260 days. Three and a half years, approximately. Three and a half years, approximately. Now, here's a problem for the futurists. They say that this three and a half years is yet to come. They believe it is a literal three and a half years. And John here calls that a short time. Yet, as I made much of in our very first sermon from the book of Revelation, John said that what he wrote about here in the book of Revelation would take place shortly. They have no problem swallowing the idea that shortly can somehow be legit when it's been nearly 2,000 years now and counting when it comes to what John had written. Yet this short time that the devil has is only three and a half years, which they affirm to be the short time. Three and a half years. That's a problem. Can three and a half years and two thousand years both be short? 
We, of course, understand the three and a half years to have already taken place since John wrote the book of Revelation from 67 to 70 A.D. with the Great Tribulation. That did take place with the destruction of Jerusalem and the annihilation of the temple in 70 A.D. And it was horrific. Just read the account of the historian Josephus to see how horrific it was. It did take place shortly. What John wrote did take place shortly. Remember he said, what I write about will take place shortly in the first chapter. In the first chapter he also said that what he was writing about, he said the time is near. The time of it happening is near, he said in Revelation 1. At the end of Revelation, when he was summarizing everything in Revelation 22, he told them again that what is going to play, take place about what he had written would take place shortly. And then he said that he was told not to seal up the prophecy because the time was at hand. And it did take place shortly. Within a few years after John wrote the book of Revelation, all this took place with the destruction of Jerusalem and the annihilation of the temple in 70 A.D. Shortly and short are about the same when you look at them in their context of Revelation. Unless you want to buy into the futurist view, which wants shortly to be 2,000 years and counting, but short to be three and a half years. It's insane. We'll continue on next time here in chapter 12 and we'll see what this flood is all about. Let's stand up and we'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we give thanks and praise to you and thank you for this time we had in your word here today. Lord, I hope many were provoked to love and to good works and to desire to dig into your word. Hallelujah, God. To search these things out. To see whether they be so or not. To see what makes more sense. The eschatological schemes that have been running around and proven false again and again for 150 years or what I'm presenting, O oh Lord. Let people dig into that. Lord, I also ask and pray that people would study Search these things out. Dig also so that they can teach others about these important matters. Lord, for so many years I wrote this all off saying, who can ever know? Who can ever figure it out? I don't even want to look at it. It just all seems so crazy. And Lord, to be able to do this study and see how clearly understandable it all is has been great. Father, I just ask and pray that we would see the importance of this for our hour in our nation. That this bogus eschatology has reaped a whirlwind of bad fruit and a messed up Christianity. We see Christian men and women walking listlessly through their lives, thinking he's going to come back any day now, so who really cares about what happens next here? And the bad impact that that thinking has had in our nation. God, I just ask and pray that you give us a hunger and thirsting to read your word and to study your word and to know your word. Father, may we be your humble servants in the earth. May we faithfully serve you. Move upon us with your spirit. For we can do nothing without you. You are the vine. We are the branches. Help us, O oh God, to serve you in the earth to bring glory, glory, glory to your name. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. May your kingdom continue to expand. For even as you said, we should pray, thy kingdom come. Praise your holy name, Father. Be with each one here. May we teach the nations, disciple them, in all your word. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You could be seated. That's what he said. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth.
as it is in heaven. Amen? There's a war in heaven. Here Christ accomplished the will of the Father. His kingdom is here now and needs to expand and does so through us being His faithful servants. Praise His holy name. Or maybe I should say in spite of us. <laughs> it continues to expand. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the writing of the Lord's table. Apostle Paul reminding us of the time at his table. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen? This bread represents the body of Christ. Praise His holy name. We know it was representative. It was a symbol of His body. It wasn't His literal body as some teach. How do we know that? Because He was sitting there with His literal body when He held the piece of bread and said, This is my body. <laughs> it's representative of His body. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This fruit of the vine is representative of the blood of Jesus Christ. They are symbols. They are the only two elements at his table. Picture a big table up here. The Lord's table would only have these two elements on it. Absolutely nothing else. There wouldn't be these two elements on his table plus a list of how many hours I spent in prayer or a list of how many good works I did. No, there's only these two elements there. Signifying this is our sole approach to God. It's through Christ, because of what he did when he died at Calvary, that God accepts us. That he meets with us. That he communes with us. Has fellowship with us. That's why verse 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. Till he comes. Amen? Now, when you know Christ, you will want to spend hours in prayer. You will want to do good works. But the point is, is you can never use those good works as a means whereby you try to approach God. You can always only approach God through Christ, plus nothing. Whether you've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, it's always only through Jesus. Those good works that we do, that holy living which we display, it's the result or the fruit or the evidence of our saving faith in Christ. We don't do those good things to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do those good things because we have obtained God's acceptance. And there's a world of difference between those two. Praise His holy name. This is why the book of Hebrews calls this a great salvation. Because God has made a great plan of salvation for us. To be redeemed unto himself and to be able to live as he desires us to live as his people. Praise his name. Let's bow our heads and we'll pray. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you that we can meet with you. That we can fellowship with you. That we can commune with you. Through your son, Jesus, Father, we thank you for this. And God, I just ask and pray that we would be your ambassadors in the earth that we would declare your holy law and this great salvation to others, that we wouldn't through cowardice or concern over reputation hide our light under a bushel, but that we would proclaim this good news from the housetops, that we would desire to talk to people about it everywhere throughout our day. Move upon us by your Holy Spirit. Anoint us, empower us by your Spirit to do your work in the earth, O oh God. When we speak of you, may your Holy Spirit convict the hearers of sin, righteousness, and judgment that they might see their need for Jesus. And God, we ask these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's partake together. Hallelujah. Let's stand and we'll pray.
Blessed is your name, O God. We rejoice in you. We give thanks to you. We praise your holy name. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all therein. The earth is yours, O Lord, in the fullness thereof. Praise your holy name. Lord, I ask and pray that you would be with each of us now as we go forth from this place and that you would work in our hearts and minds by your spirit, that we would pick up our Bibles, which are our swords, and we would read them this coming week. Lord Jesus, you said that your words are spirit and they are life. We cannot live for you. We cannot survive. We will be malnourished orphans if we do not read your word. Lord, I just ask and pray that we would be readers of your word. I ask and pray, O oh God, that we would spend time in prayer and seeking your face. I ask that each man here would be a priest to his home. And would open your word to his wife and to his children and instruct them from your scriptures. May each woman here be a helpmate to her husband in all that you've given him to do. Father, we ask and pray that you would be with each young person here. Ask that they would use their strength, not in selfish pursuits, but in service to you and your kingdom. May they desire to seek your face and say, God, what do you want me to do? With my life. Oh Lord. What do you want me to do? Lord I ask and pray that. Each child here would be a blessing to the home. Honoring their mother and father. Being a blessing. To each home. May each older person. Be an example of holy living. To their progeny. Their grandchildren. Their great grandchildren. Lord I just ask and pray. That you give us hearts hungry for you. Stir our hearts after you, O God. May we see you have a conquering kingdom. Not only in regards to personal lives, O God, but to nations and cultures. Praise your holy name. And may we, O Lord, submit all of our personal lives to you. And I ask this in Jesus' name. May we do it fully. In Christ Jesus' name I ask, O oh God. Amen. Praise His name.